Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to our final um, talk celebrating the biodiversity in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, this talk's um, led by Emily Milhouse, who you might remember did our talk on amphibians a few weeks back. It'll be about an hour to an hour and ten in length and there'll be time for questions afterwards. Um, the housekeeping instructions are given on the home screen, which hopefully you can see at the moment. And now I'll just pass over to Emily and give my thanks to the Friends of Modern Park for their continued sponsorship. So Emily, welcome again and thanks very much for joining us for your talk on lizards this time. Perfect. Thank you for that, Trevor. Um, so yeah, and thank you to everyone who's uh, joining us this evening. It's certainly not uh, lizard weather right now in London. Um, absolutely chucking it down with rain. But we will begin. So for those of us um, that weren't here a few weeks ago, as Trevor had said, during the amphibian talk, um, just to give you an introduction on, on who frog life are, and of course our, our name's a bit deceiving, um, particularly as, as frog in it, people tend to think of us doing amphibian based work, but we do also look after our reptiles. So there's, there's the main part of frog life, which is who I work for, so the Frog Life Trust, um, which is the national um, wildlife conservation charity for um, reptiles and amphibians in their habitats. So our work is broken down into the three main areas of habitat work. So going out, building ponds, restoring ponds, working on terrestrial habitats. So anything from, uh, well, we'll talk about it a bit later, um, reptile basking banks and things like that. We do a lot of work with education and engagement. So we work across schools, um, we work across allotments and basically any kind of event where we can uh, give a bit more profile to these adorable animals. Um, and then research is our sort of third arm to the kind of work that we do. So we work a lot globally with um, other partners that look into amphibian and reptile conservation, um, looking at disease, looking at sort of trends or any form of mitigation we can do to help our species. So at the moment, one of the big areas of research we're doing in the UK is actually looking into wildlife tunnels. Um, and how they should be sort of implemented um, during new developments, particularly where habitats are being sort of uh, split down the middle, essentially, um, to be able to give animals a sort of rite of passage to still be connected to different, uh, different places. The other side of frog life is the ecological services. Um, so that's essentially our trading arm where you can uh, get in touch with us if you want any form of work done, whether it's surveying work, um, bigger sort of scale habitat works, and onto training courses. So without further ado, uh, we will begin with our, our, uh, our talk. So of course, before jumping in feet first into the common lizards, we'll talk around a few of the other natives that we do have, although I, I don't expect to find all of these within London for sure. Um, we'll talk a bit about a few non-natives, so just a couple that you may also find on your travels. So first off, we'll kick off with our, with our seven natives. So at the top we have our lizards um, we have the top corner there so viviparous lizard or common lizard um, you will find sometimes i'll flick between those two names um, both names is fine for that species uh, we've got the slow worm in the middle which is the uk's one legless lizard um, sand lizard on the right hand side then we've got our three snakes so we've got the grass snake the adder and the smooth snake and to add to that i did say seven we also have the leatherback turtle. Now, for sure, of all of them species there, it's the leatherback turtle I would never expect to get a record of um, within London. Um, but you do find them around the coast of the UK. So recently, quite a lot along the, uh, the coast of Wales, there's been quite a lot of sightings of leatherback turtles. Um, so by all means, if you're interested in them, um, have a look online. You'll see many different videos of them in the past month or so. Um, you'll see them sort of swimming. So, yeah. It's quite a bit going on uh, reptile wise, but they just don't quite get as, enough, um, as much press as some of their other species. So the four main ones you will tend to spot and um, the sort of four common ones that we do find. And these are also the four most common reptiles that we have within London. So we have our common lizard in the top left. We have our adder, which you tend to find around sort of the outskirts. So the outer London boroughs, you'll find a few populations of them. The grass snake, which you can find uh, pretty much spanning all of London, really. Um, quite a lot of boroughs have sightings of grass snakes, particularly any areas that have very large ponds. So a good example for that is when you head to places in um, like in Camden. Um, Hampstead Heath, um, very, very large ponds there and there's quite a good population of grass snakes there. And then the trusty slow worm, um, which you certainly do find across, um, particularly across actually West, West London um, and a lot of allotment plots and places like that. Essentially, if you have a compost, compost heap in West London, uh, quite a high chance you might have a slow worm within it. So they're perfect home. So right, we will kick off first a little bit of the identification um, that we look for with the common lizard. So 
one of the key things that I always love bringing up, particularly when I do these talks in person, we have lovely A3 laminates where the common lizard is blown up to a huge proportion. Um, it's just to think about the actual size of the common lizard. So it's quite small. Um, so we put it at about sort of 12 to 15 centimetres, but that is including its tail. And if you can spot my cursor just here going onto this bottom photo, you'll actually see here that the tail is actually longer than the length of its body. And that's something you'll spot on the common lizard. So it's generally about the same size, the tail um, to the actual body itself, or sometimes a little longer. But primarily, most of that 12 to 15 centimetres is actually that tail. Um, also, if they've ever dropped their tail, quite a dramatic smaller size. So you'd be looking at the actual body only being about six or seven centimetres in length by itself. Um, so they are a very small lizard. They're also quite a, a sort of a skinny um, or slender lizard. So they're quite thin compared to um, the sand lizard, which we'll have a brief look at, um, which is quite a stocky um, lizard that we have. They're a lot smaller. Coloration wise, um, they do range quite a bit, really. So we have here the brown or green skin. Um, so this one here on the right hand side is slightly sort of more olive coloured. Um, you will actually find when you go to places like the London Wetland Centre, so down in towards Barnes, um, where they've got quite a large population of common lizards, um, quite often you'll find quite a lot of colour morphs, which are almost sort of an intense sort of a deep green, almost like a, I suppose, a sort of a spinachy kind of green, a nice dark spinach green, um, and you will spot them out and about. But one of the key things that you're going to look for to see that it is a common lizard as opposed to any other type of lizard is the first big feature, and this bottom photo is perfect to show it, um, they have these lovely dark flanks. So if you see these dark sort of bands of the sides of its bodies, so these sort of like ventrodorsal flanks just here, um, if those are sort of dark in coloration to the, the rest of the body color, um, you'll know it's definitely a common lizard that you're spotting. The other thing, um, which I always think is a funny one to look out for because common lizards are incredibly quick, um, is they've got quite a small head. Um, so whoop, I've lost my mouse. Uh, there we go. Um, so you'll see here it is quite a quite a sort of short head, um, but the, the snout is quite pointed. So you'll see it comes to the end quite quickly. Um, you may also find on these heads, um, particularly with the females who have slightly smaller heads, you'll sometimes find scarring around sort of the top and the back, sort of essentially where there's a, if you if you could say a lizard has a neck, which it doesn't particularly change in shape from its head. If you see any scarring there, it tends to be a, a, a female that you're looking at just because it's the way that the males will clasp onto them. We will talk a bit more about the um, the interesting way that lizards mate <laughs> in, a, in a few slides time, but we'll look a bit more into the differences between the males and females. So, of course, this is a uh, Two very lucky people that have had photos of uh, lizards very still uh, at this point in time. So we have the male at the top and these sort of ocelli or I would prefer to call them sort of eye markings um, across their body. If you're spotting that sort of pretty much scattered around their entire body. So everything from a sort of almost like a, a white or cream circle that's got a slightly darker band uh, around it tends to just be the, the males that you're looking at. Whereas at the females, if we look lower down, you'll see they've got this vertebral line that runs just from the base of their head all the way down their body. Um, it basically stops just about where you can see the, the tail starting on this lizard here. So if you're seeing that, that vertebral line, then you know it's a female uh, common lizard that you're spotting. Of course, on the odd occasion, uh, you might find the female hasn't developed a, a very, very uh, strong or as bold uh, sort of dark line like this. She may have the odd breaks within that, but pretty much if you can spot, particularly if you have quite a nice camera, um, if any of you are keen bird watchers, you tend to have a really good lens with this kind of thing. Um, if you're spotting it, that it's a pretty consistent line running down their back, then you know it's a female that you're spotting. The other thing when I was talking a bit about the heads, um, again, it's always tough to spot with lizards because the minute there's any disturbance, they've quickly run away. But I'll give you one of my top tips uh, for that at the moment, which is um, if you do come to an area and you've just seen, let's say, the tail end of a common lizard disappearing into the undergrowth, um, just sit down for a little bit. If you give them about 10, 15 minutes, they're very loyal to where they bask. So if they've chosen a place they want to bask for a season, they tend to go straight back to that spot. So if you sit there, give it a bit of time. Uh, don't disturb the grass or anything around. Don't cast any sort of uh, shadows from that specific area. It's very likely they'll pop back and you'll be able to get a really good eye of that lizard that you did spot. If you are lucky to get that moment to happen where you get to see them nice and up and close, uh, the males you'll also notice have a much broader head. 
Um, so it's a lot sort of thicker in its sort of shaping, whereas the female's head comes down in, into that sort of pointed snout a lot quicker. Uh, the other thing, again, you've got to have you've got to have good eyes for this. Um, great if you've got any children out with you, you can get them on this task. Uh, but just here at the base of the tail, uh, you get the penal bulge on a common lizard. So you can see there's almost a there's a, just basically a slight bulge behind where the back legs are. Whereas you'll see on the female, her tail thickness is pretty consistent from the uh, the back of her sort of well from her back, sorry, down into the culmination of her tail. The other thing is their bellies. Uh, now, of course, you're going to have to get up close and personal to be able to see bellies. With this, I will talk a bit about um, handling. It's arguably the most important thing to talk about when we think about lizards in the UK. Um, only really handle if necessary, or if you're doing a survey with people that do it often, um, it's quite stressful um, for, for lizards to be lifted up and have a look at, and you don't particularly want to kick in any of their behaviours, like dropping tails or, or anything else that may affect them. Um, but you will see by this photo, it's quite different. So we have the male on the left hand side, so that quite vibrant sort of orange or, or sort of bright yellow belly. In some occasions, we've actually seen up in Scotland, um, common lizards have almost a red coloured belly, whereas the females a lot more muted um, in their coloration there. So you'll see it's almost sort of a, a sort of pastel off white kind of coloration. Um, but yeah, you, you won't find common lizards basking with their bellies up. Um, so it's very much if you're just out doing a survey and you've got anyone that is handling them or if you're doing a full survey, trying to figure out what sex of this pop population of lizards you have. Um, it's a really easy way to be able to check rather than looking for the bulge or for the actual uh, head shape. So just to compare with the other lizard that you may come across um, elsewhere in the UK, um, so the sand lizard. Um, so sand lizards, uh, the male, it's he's quite obviously different um, to the, the common lizards in the way that he's lovely sort of a, a lovely vivid green on his sides. Um, it will tend to fade, so that's a male in peak breeding um, coloration, so he's very, very bright green. It will sort of start to die down a little in colour there, but he's always very obviously green. Um, the other key thing there is you'll notice his sort of eyelets or, or eye markings or his ocelli on his back, you can see they pretty much are only present along that flank, um, whereas that male common lizard had it all across the main bit of his back. Whereas if we look down here at the female, sticking with the theme of many sort of uh, UK wildlife, in that um, the females tend to be a lot, a lot better camouflaged to any sort of um, background behind them, primarily there just to make sure that obviously when they've got any form of eggs or, or when they're going through mating, they can just stay better hidden. Whereas the males need to be showing that they're strong enough um, to be the good choice essentially for those females to mate with. So she tends to be that sort of brown, grey coloration. Um, she tends to have, almost like the female common lizard, she'll have a sort of a, a central band that will run right down her body. Um, it's a little bit different to the bands that we look for on the, the female common lizard in the way that you'll see there's sort of two white lines and it's a much thicker band that you'll see running down here. Um, but again, she is noticeably different um, to the common lizard that we were just talking about. Another big tell is in the Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, uh, you will not be finding sand lizards. Um, you, you, you may have the, the lucky occasion where you'll spot a common lizard at one of their sites. We'll talk a bit about that later on, um, of where exactly they're present within the borough. But yeah, it's not going to be a sand lizard you're going to spot. But if you're heading down into, let's say, Surrey, so not too far away, so into Surrey, Kent, down into Sussex, um, and then all the way essentially along the, the southwest coast, that's where we start to find sand lizards more prevalent. Um, you do tend to find them, their name kind of suggests really, they prefer the kind of heathlands or very sandy areas um, to be within, which, uh, which London tends not to have. So we'll just have a look at the, uh, the, oh, the slides flipped around for me there. Um, we'll look at the juvenile common lizard. Um, so they're a lot smaller. So we spoke about the size of the adults being about sort of 12 to 14 centimetres. Um, they're about four centimetres or roughly an inch when born uh, and they tend to come out jet black. So when they when they're sort of laid as a as an egg essentially I, I go for egg like this because um the way that common lizards lay their eggs it's essentially not a nice hard sort of casing or shell that you might find on um, a snake it's far more leathery um it's almost just like a 
a sort of film that goes around the actual egg itself. So within 24 hours of her laying the egg, um, it will have hatched into this, into this young. So all of her incubation will be happening inside of her body. After a few weeks, um, that's when you start to see them turning slightly more copper in colour. So you can see here at the front, they're starting to get this sort of a more ready orange coloration. Um, but if it was sort of a day or two old, you'd be much closer at looking at their backs and they'd almost look this kind of jet black. When it comes to their sort of sexual maturity, um, generally looking about two years, so two good hibernations and the males are ready to go and they'll be out looking for territory. Um, and they will then start to, to mate with females in, the, in their territories and in their areas. Whereas the females take slightly longer um, to become sexually mature. So you're looking at about three years for them to get to that point. To give you an estimation about the kind of lifespan of, of a common lizard, um, generally the average lifespan sits at about six years. Um, whereas we have known them to grow up to sort of 10 to 12 years, it is possible, um, but there's just quite a lot of pressures on their habitat and often to do with disturbance, um, while we don't tend to find them that, that high. We'll talk a bit about predators and, and issues that they fall into later on. So when people think lizards, they tend to think tail shedding, it's the first thing that comes into their mind. So essentially, that's a, the lizard's main way of getting away from any predator is to drop their tail. So just over here on the images on the right kind of shows you how it happens really. Um, so they've got quite a strong muscle at the top of their the top of their tail area and essentially that muscle contracts just like a vice and it fractures um, this sort of vertebra here that's run right down its back into its tail and as it crushes um, that sort of that, that bone within there completely fractures it to, uh, to release essentially the tail from their body that contraction also has a second really important thing um, to be able to see was it constricts that art a main sort of artery or that blood vessel here, the caudal artery. That stops um, the lizard from losing any blood from its body. It's actually quite a quite a gnarly thing to have a look at. I'm quite glad in, in this presentation I have the drawing version of this. Um, you can go on YouTube and you can look up exactly if when they drop their tail what it looks like. Um, it almost looks a bit like something out of Alien versus Predator, um, where there's no blood, but you'll see it keep moving. Um, but it's quite an interesting thing to be able to see them do. And pretty much at the point at which it's dropped, you'll find the lizard itself will run off and the tail will remain and keep sort of twitching um, for a period of time to distract any predator. So the three big reasons there, as I mentioned, that physical escape for them to get away. So if a, let's say a fox has picked one of these lizards up um, and they've picked them up by the tail, they can detach that tail then they've got away distraction if they've got a fox or something like that a predator nearby that has spotted them and they're um they're alarmed by this they drop it at that point and run so you'll find it still twitching to distract any predator there and then the third one kind of important for any of our um common lizards that might be in areas where maybe we have adders or particularly for the common lizard which has quite a big range um globally um, many other sort of venomous snakes or venomous animals that they may come in contact with. If those animals have bitten the tail area, of course, by cutting off that blood supply instantly, they're preventing any form of venom getting into their main sort of body around their organs. Although this is fantastic as an anti-predator mechanism, it is, you are to be aware that it's not going to be great in the long run for the common lizards or, or any lizards really to drop tails particularly as we move into this kind of time of year uh, where the lizards are starting to slow down a bit in their behaviours. Um, you're not finding them out and, out and about as much and they're looking for places to, to hibernate. Um, it's not great for them to be leaving their, their fat stores, their energy stores that would get them through hibernation behind. Ideally, it's best to keep them all together, which is one of the other reasons why we say if you don't have to handle them, or you don't have to disturb them per se, we would, uh, we would advise you to to not bother picking them up because um, if they're losing that tail they may get away at that point but it might not be as great for them in a few months time. So we'll do a very quick dip into the, the non-natives in the UK. Uh, quick stipulation there that although that says the UK um, I'm talking in the frame of mainland um, um, UK so when we're talking about the Channel Islands so Guernsey and Jersey you will find other lizards in those areas. So we have lizard number one in question, which is our common wall lizard. So common wall lizards, um, 
you will spot them around in some areas of the UK. Well, I say some areas, but we'll talk a bit about that. I won't jump the gun. Um, we'll go through their ID primarily. They have a very long tail. Um, they're also quite a leggy uh, lizard as is the next lizard we're going to look at. So when they stand up, they tend to be a lot higher in elevation from the ground that they tend to be laying on. Whereas our common lizards, when they're moving, that belly's pretty consistently in contact with the, the floor that they're on. They have very, very fine scales. So I'm just going to avert your attention to this top right photo. So you'll see here the scales are really, really small. Whereas in our common lizard and our sand lizard, they're actually a lot blockier. They're a lot larger in the way that they look. The other thing is this collar. Um, so this is although uh, luckily that wasn't my finger having a little uh, nibble. Um, <laughs> you'll see here this collar. It's a lovely sort of perfect straight line of scales. That's not something again that you'd find on common lizards. Um, common lizards, it would be a lot more jagged, um, a lot more erratic in its, in its sort of scale patterning. Um, yeah, it's a lot more refined, uh, the wall lizard scale pattern, uh, which is also useful for when they slough or they shed their skin. Um, you, can you can still be able to identify what lizard it is that you've found um, just by their sort of slough that's been left behind. They tend to be this sort of mottled black pattern um, with sort of green or brown coloration across their body, as you can spot here. They have a very sort of almost like a pencil shaped sort of head, so the pencil nib, very, very pointed snout. Um, it's a lot longer face wise um, compared to our common lizard. So just something to be to be mindful of when you're when you're looking at them. So I said a bit about their distribution. Um, we do find them in places we'd expect to only find them in Jersey, uh, but there are colonies across um, the UK, really. Um, Hampshire um, and the Isle of Wight, those kind of areas are actually got quite a few populations of wall lizards in those spaces. Um, you will you will sometimes spot them in those kind of areas. I mentioned that they're quite leggy. This is a great photo to show it. Um, you'll see here his elevation from the floor is quite high. They do tend to prefer basking in basically incredibly exposed um, locations. So you tend to find them on the cliffs or in any form of sort of old fortifications or old buildings. So anything sort of around castles or, or stone walls is perfect for them. Um, yeah, you'll find them very much out, out and about. There's the two forms. Um, so we looked in that last slide of a, a green backed uh, wall lizard, whereas this one you can see is a, a lot browner in coloration, even actually a little closer to orange in the way that it looks. Um, if you're interested in spotting common wall lizards, um, there are volunteer groups all around the UK that go out and they um, they survey for these pretty consistently along with our native species. Um, and if you're truly keen in getting involved in the conservation of, of our natives, um, they'll go out and they'll have a look and they'll keep an eye on these sort of target non-native species as well that are around. Which takes us on to our second, uh, the very aptly named green lizard. Um, luck, luckily, its name is very true to what it is. Um, so it is an incredibly green lizard. I'll quickly add, just because of course this slide says Western green lizard. Um, there are two variations of the green lizard. So there's the Eastern um, green lizard, which you'll find across Eastern Europe and the Western um, green lizard, which you find everything from sort of Germany towards us. Um, in the UK, it's only Western green lizards we find, so we tend to just call them green lizards here. If you've spotted them, it's likely these guys uh, that you have seen. We said bright green. Um, I'm not kidding. They are very, very bright, uh, bright green. Their heads from the top, particularly males like this one here at the bottom. If you were to look at them straight on from the top, the heads are quite dark from coloration, which is in quite a difference uh, to the throats of the males. So the males throats go quite a bright uh, blue, particularly you would see that more. So mm, I, I would say this time of year, but this kind of weather wouldn't be a great time to, be able to spot uh, the green lizards either. Um, so in the sort of summertime is when you'd expect to see him going as blue as possible on that throat and a lovely sort of bright green. I will avert your eyes to that fourth bullet point, um, which is again the size up to 40 centimetres. They're well over double um, the size of the sand lizard. So if you're ever unsure about that slight greenish green sort of tint of a, a sand lizard um, compared to the green lizard. Um, yeah, if it's that large, then you definitely know it's a green lizard you're spotting at. And also that variation, it's nearly sort of a three and a half times the size of our actual uh, common lizard. So quite different. So. We'll just touch upon where we'd expect to find them. If you're holidaying in Guernsey or Jersey, 
we'd expect to find them in that kind of area. We have that one population down in Devon. So just outside Bournemouth, we've got the Boscombe Cliffs. Um, you will find there's one population of green lizards there. There's actually a few studies um, that's been, look, been looking at green lizards in this area. Um, one of the things they have noticed, or at least on the preliminary findings, is that actually when green lizards are present, they do push out common lizard populations. So it is something that is going to, well, it needs, it needs more time, uh, a longer sort of research period to be able to check if that is true, um, that it's completely moving the whole population, but you tend not to find green lizards in the same spot that common lizards move into. Primarily due to that size, I suppose, it's very hard to compete with something that's so, so much vastly larger than you. Um, yeah, habitats that they like, uh, they much prefer that sort of bushier vegetation, which isn't a big comparison to the wall lizard, which prefers it straight out um, with as much exposure as, as possible, no form of sort of cover to go into. Um, but yeah, you find them in a variety of different places across Europe. Um, but in the UK, you're looking at the Channel Islands or, or that one, one cliff area um, down in uh, Dorset. So we'll have a look at that distribution of what we expect. So the common lizard, rightly so, um, is called a common lizard, um, as it is very common. Um, it's the one native lizard species to Ireland, um, so they're spread all across Ireland. Um, you find them all across the UK, even as you sort of head into different islands up in sort of the western part of Scotland. Um, they're the furthest ranging um, lizard in all of Europe, so you can find them all the way up in the Arctic Circle. You'll find them from there, spanning all through Europe, all the way down into Italy. Um, so they've got quite a big range of what they can accept. Um, they're pretty happy in most habitats, uh, which is why they tend to do a bit better off than some of our others. To give you a, a consensus of that, of course, you can barely even see London down here um, under, under dots. We'll look in comparison to the sand lizard, which is our other native um, lizard with legs that you will find. You'll see how sporadic they are with um, essentially Surrey and Hampshire being their stronghold. There are populations all around. Um, you, you're not going crazy and it's not an error that there is a population of sand lizards um, up on the west coast of, of Scotland on one of the islands. Um, if you're super into your lizards after this talk and you want to learn a bit more about these lizards, it's actually really interesting to look at they think there's been a bit there's been so much separation between the northern populations of sand lizards compared to the southern populations that are starting to see changes between them so there's a lot of work going into how different are they um, and any form of efforts um, to essentially repopulate sand lizards back into the areas they should have been back into their range um, there's a lot of work into this at the moment you'll see there's reintroductions of sand lizards all across the south coast and and up through uh, the top of wales essentially but anyway, back to our common lizards. We've, we've covered the other lizards you might spot on your travels, um, but looking at the ecology um, of what kind of what they're doing essentially across their year. Um, so our common lizards would be high, looking to hibernate um, from about now, really. Um, so about a month or so's time um, through to November, that's when you tend, you're not going to be finding them out and about as much. This is their last month of any form of activity, going out eating as much as they can to prepare for hibernation. So they'll tend to be looking for areas um, that aren't too boggy at this time of year. They'll be looking for nice sort of uh, dry spots that they can they can get nice and hidden hidden away with them. Um, they're a really interesting species when it comes to hibernation. Um, they will hibernate in huge groups, so you can get sort of up to 30 or 40 of them all together, which of course has benefits of not only are you sharing warmth in that little area as you hibernate, um, also there's that prophecy of safety in numbers, that if a predator did appear, um, then of course you've got less chance that you're going to be the unlucky thing that gets eaten. Um, but they do also, and you will quite readily find them hibernating individually, so you may get one individual um, that will be under a single log that's quite happy in hibernating there. Also benefits to that, of course, um, that you're going to have less disturbance as other lizards sort of if they wake up early or if they're having a bad hibernation, maybe they haven't eaten enough earlier on in the year and they get up earlier and they're disturbing you. Um, so benefits to both, but quite an interesting behaviour in a sense that they're quite happy to do both. Um, and you'll see that very even within populations on certain sites. Just that little... Uh, sort of a caveat there, just mentioning the sand lizards. A lot of sand lizards will already be looking um, to hibernate right now. So they've sort of done their whole breeding season and they're, yeah, they're heading back down into the scrub to stay hidden, uh, to see through the cold weather. 
So through all of that sort of winter period, you tend not to be spotting them out and about. Uh, they will be hidden away. They'll start to emerge sort of uh, around February, March time. Tend to find this kind of this year, they came out a bit later, so it was generally around the March mark, sort of mid-March onwards is when we started to see our common lizards in the UK. Um, they're the first um, of our lizards that does appear. Um, so you tend to spot them before your slow worms have started moving on, unless, unless of course, it's an unlucky slow worm that has a very keen allotment plot holder who's um, started sorting out their ground sheets that early on in the year. Um, but yep, it's the first you tend to find emerging. And you will find for that sort of March period, um, as the males come out, what they'll be doing is they'll be spending a lot of time sort of just traversing for that first few weeks, so maybe two, three weeks. They'll be traversing around sort of the land around them and their range generally it's about 200 to 250 meters. Um, once they've found an area that tends to be their kind of territory that they'll hold. Um, he'll be looking for the best areas to bask and he'll be defending those um, because of course the, the male common lizard that has the best areas to bask can present that to any female lizards um, who can then turn up and bask there and in turn he can mate with them. So he'll be looking for that area essentially and then when you get to about May where everything's kind of settled and the females have also all emerged, uh, you'll then start to find if you are disturbing them or if you go out on the same sort of walk every single day, you'll find them in those same areas where they've basically decided for this summer, this is the area I'll be basking in. Um, so yeah, lots certainly to, to spot. Uh, they get all of their sort of uh, sloughing or all of their sk uh, skin shedding over and done with nice and early in the year. So pretty much as they're coming out in sort of, uh, well, as this year, March, kind of time, um, you'll find that's when you start to spot all of their kind of uh, their skin, essentially, that they've shed and is around any of the kind of places for that. You're going to just be looking for, I suppose, think like a lizard, really, anywhere that's getting that lovely south facing sun. So anything that's lovely and warm, maybe sort of slightly on the edge of habitat. So between sort of um, grassland and maybe bushes, that kind of area that you're looking for, where they, they can easily dart away from any predators. Look in those kind of spaces um, for any any skins and of course if you spot them then you know you're in luck keep an eye on the area because it means they're about so looking a bit into their their courtship and mating um it all kind of kicks off um sort of mid-april through to may pretty much as the as the females appear um the males which have all been going around eating as much as they can uh, shedding that skin and deciding where the territories are going to be roughly that then kicks in when all the sort of the the fighting or the tussles between the males then occur. Um, so as the females start to appear, you'll find there'll be a lot more sort of uh, scuffles or whatever um, in the kind of areas between males. So if you're very patient and you can sit in areas for a long period of time, if you've spotted them, you may find males that will move around a territory. Um, and if they're coming in contact with other males, um, you may then find there's there's moments of sort of biting down on each other's heads or limbs um, to try and essentially dominate that this area is theirs. It still tends to be um, the older and larger uh, lizards tend to hold the best territories. Um, it just tends to be the bigger you are, uh, the stronger you are, the more likely you are to beat any sort of smaller lizards um, to have the best areas. They will mate frequently um, <laughs> throughout this time. So the males and females will have multiple partners over this whole period of time. As the female moves around, uh, she'll make as many males as possible within this period. Likewise, the male will be was making as many females as he can. It's a very quick um, <laughs> mating time. It's about 30 minutes maximum um, for copulation to occur um, with common lizards. So it's pretty much he'll grab her. The first thing he'll do is he'll actually before he gets into this position here, he'll clamp down onto the back of her head, which is why I was talking about if you ever see scarring there, tends to be a female that you're looking at. He basically is clamping down there and he's going to hold onto her to get her into the right position. He'll then essentially bend her body almost into a sort of curved shape so that he can wrap himself around um, and he'll put their two sort of vents together. So her vent just here and then his vent just here and he'll then deliver um, his sperm to her and that's kind of their period of period of copulation done. At that point, they'll separate from each other and disappear off and continue mating with as many others as possible, which is the complete other end of the spectrum to the, the, to the humble slow worm, uh, which can take up to 10 hours uh, to mate with one individual. And they tend to stay in a much smaller space. Um, 
So even with our lizards, we do find in and around London, they've got quite different behaviours at this time of year. Uh, beyond this period of time, you'll then start to look for the um, sort of after three, three to four weeks, essentially, after um, they've been mated, uh, that's when the female will start egg laying or, or giving birth uh, to any of her live young. So just having a look at that sort of um, in a table form, essentially, so it's uh, nice and uh, clear to see. Um, yeah, it's pretty unelaborate. It's essentially when they find each other, the mating will occur They're very quick. Um, so it's going to be over and done with pretty swiftly. Um, as I mentioned there, they'll mate multiple times with different partners. The egg laying itself, um, the clutch tends to be between three and 11. Generally, you're looking at about five or six um, will will tend to be laid by the female. Um, oh, that's the word I should have said earlier, uh, membrane um, rather than film. Um, there's a very sort of thin membrane that's around that, um, which we would still call the, the egg per se, but within about 24 hours, um, that young that young sort of a uh, one inch or three or four centimeter um, juvenile common lizard at that point will have hatched out. And pretty much essentially, that's it. They're going it alone um, and they'll start to hunt their own prey at that period of time. Um, so yeah, pretty active. They're also the, the lizards that right now you're more likely to spot um, out and about. Sort of September time is their last big push, essentially, for the juveniles. Um, they're trying to double, essentially, their their body weight at this time of year. Um, so they're trying to consume as much as possible to almost double completely in size uh, to get them through that first hibernation and give them a real good start, which is kind of why that mortality rate is pretty high. Um, so it is about 90% of those that, that do hatch out um, is unlikely to make it through their sort of first year up until their... Um, their first sort of hibernation time. So that's before they hit any form of sexual maturity for both the males and females, um, primarily because they are just going out trying to consume as much as they can to grow large enough to become sexually mature. Also, um, due to their size, there's a lot more predators that are more likely to be able to, to, to catch up with them and spot them. So just here having a little look at um, how, it, how it would pan out, essentially, if you were in the lizard world, um, how this courtship would go down. Um, so the males will be out um, looking, um, seeking for any females that are in their territory or in territories that are adjacent to them. Um, there's a lot going on with a male lizard this time of year. He really does have to put a lot of work in uh, to make sure that he is getting a chance to mate with the females. He'll not only be fighting with all the males, he'll be chasing males away constantly to hold his best territory. Um, and then he'll be mating intermittently between doing all of that fighting and uh, chasing people away. He'll then be mating with as many females as possible. And then, of course, if he's got time, he'll be squeezing and eating as much as he can. Um, as I mentioned earlier, those larger, much older males will chase off the smaller males. Um, it's just how it goes. Um, Essentially, the, the larger lizards uh, are more likely to win in any of these sort of battles or, or fights um, for territories and for the females. So you just tend to see the larger ones will have more chance to mate with more females. Um, it's quite a short and elaborate courtship. It's not like the uh, the dancing newts that you find in the amphibian world, where the males not only make themselves pretty, they'll do whole elaborate courtship with um, many different patterns on bellies. I know we spoke about it a few weeks ago. Um, certainly none of that happens with common lizards. Uh, this is a, a great image showing exactly what happens and what's in store uh, for the female lizard of if the male's there. He'll pretty much grab her by the neck and he'll curve that body. So as I, as I mentioned before, sort of creating that semicircle so that he can wrap himself around her. He'll tend to use his back legs to position himself just to allow that to occur. Um, it doesn't take very long for this to occur. He tends to he can get her into position within about five minutes, depending on how compliant I suppose she is. Um, if she's completely doesn't want to mate, um, she will also fight back and you'll see, um, well, it's quite, I suppose a, it's almost a show of her pride if the female turns around and she'll bite down quite hard on the male's tail or on his limbs. And at that point, he will release and, and let her move on. But if she is compliant and we're getting this moment happen, um, yeah, maximum 30 minutes, uh, the male release and then that's it. He's off um, and he's looking for someone else to mate with and the female the exact same. 
This is probably one of the coolest things with common lizards and one of the lesser known things about what they're up to. So it's not as simple as running around trying to find as many females as possible for the males. Um, there's three different strategies um, which actually show themselves in coloration on common lizards. So the orange belly um, males, they invade and mate by force. So essentially they tend to be, um, I suppose the, the more boisterous of the three here, they'll dart into territories, they'll fight with males and essentially any female that they see, they'll run at, fight, try and mate with her. The yellow belly males, um, so this one here on the, the right, um, so they go orange belly in the middle, yellow belly on the right hand side, uh, they'll invade and mate by deception. So they're not that daft when the orange bellied um, common lizards are running out of their own territory to fight with other males in adjacent territories. The yellow, be yellow bellied lizards uh, will slip into these unguarded territories, essentially mate with all the females in that space and then disappear off out before the orange bellied common lizards come back. The white bellied um, common lizard, so like this guy just over here, um, they guard mate and they cooperate, so you'll get groups of them. They'll all work together um, where they, they'll essentially find a female. They'll all mate with her in quick succession, but they'll keep her completely guarded from any of the other um, lizards. So to have a, it's almost like rock, paper, scissors here of how it works. Um, so essentially the force um, tends to be the cooperation. Um, so it all, it's essentially those orange bellied lizards are essentially just looking for where the females are at when they're locked on to where a female could be they're running straight towards her and they're going to mate with her at any cost um, whilst this is occurring um so in that in that scenario uh orange orange is winning um, and then white beats yellow when it comes to deception because of course as they're all cooperating to guard the females no deception can occur there is no unguarded territory or unguarded females and then likewise, uh, deception, the yellow bellied lizards will beat the orange ones because the orange ones are off fighting everyone else uh, to mate with the females whilst leaving their own females in their territory completely unguarded. Probably the most interesting thing about that is the fact that on a population, anywhere you go, so the population within the Royal Borough of Kensington Chelsea is likely um, around the Little Wormwood Scrubs area and the kind of adjacent um, sort of train line or, or railway line in that kind of area um, you would see this even in small populations when you compare places like that all the way through to massive heathlands um, elsewhere in the UK so you head down into Hampshire you'll find that belly colour cycles all the time in the population um, so there'll never be one population of all orange belly common lizards it essentially as one does very well for a year or two uh, you'll find there'll be an insurgence of those that have been born with the other coloured bellies um, genetically. They'll move through and they'll take over. And it's just a really interesting thing to see. There's been many studies looking into this at how eventually it balances out. And it's just a constant uh, cyclical motion of what types of uh, male common lizard strategies you're spotting. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating this. For, for an animal that is that little, um, it's going on where many people don't realise it's happening. Uh, there's a lot happening in the in parks and green spaces over uh, over summer. And particularly this year, it's very likely um, our common lizards in the UK have done quite well. There's been a lot less disturbance on sort of paths and in, in larger sort of open spaces, of course, as, as lockdowns occurred. But essentially from when that happened um, in March going through, that's, that's as our lizards, common lizards particularly, would have been most active. So we may find next year we might have a quite a decent population of common lizards uh, sprouting up. So I'll expect to see a load of sightings coming through on the Dragon Finder app from everyone at this talk as they're spotting things around London. So we're talking a bit about that growth. Um, we spoke about when they when they're first born, they're about an inch or three to four centimetres in size. Um, I'm mentioning about that that sort of doubling essentially in their weight before it gets to hibernation, what they're doing right now, the juveniles. Um, you're going to be seeing a little bit more sort of sloughing occurring from the young ones now. So unlike the adults, which will slough earlier on in the season, so around March time, it's about now you're going to see that on the young ones, primarily just due to their size having such a rapid change, essentially. Um, again, I mentioned you can tell what, what species it is by the slough that's left behind. Um, when you time to find I always think lizards look quite grumpy when they're sloughing. It's a, probably a personal thing, but I always think they look a bit a bit annoyed when they've got bits of uh, dead skin essentially being rubbed off dead scales. So 
They'll slough into sections, um, any of our lug lizards, so slow worms and common lizards, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> um, common lizards and sand lizards uh, will slough in sort of sections in parts. So you may find that he sloughed three of his legs and he's still working on the last one. They'll slough their head separately. Then they'll have their main sort of flank, their main body here, and sections of their tail will go. Whereas the slow worm is actually really nice that, of course, not having uh, legs, it's quite easy for them to slough in the way that when they burrow down into the soil, um, you'll find that their slough will come off in a sort of rings, essentially, as it will just slide down through their body. They still do, of course, um, look a little patchy at times with their sort of duller looking skin where they haven't quite got their, their fresh scales on show. Um, but it is really handy that even if you've started to, to look late, so if you're starting to do sort of common lizard surveys, even now at this time of year, which is very late in the season to have a look, you may still find young about and you may find young sloughs uh, about. So any sort of uh, any sort of skin that's been shed in the areas. So it is worth having a look. So just have a look at what they're out and eating and what eats them. Um, so they're very active when it comes to hunting. Uh, it was only the other day we had a, a video shared with us on Twitter um, showing um, a common lizard that was eating a spider. Uh, actually, he was eating three spiders, um, which took him about six minutes in time. Um, they'll pretty much grab whatever they can find. They'll chase after, grab it. At the point in which they grab it, they thrash their heads around quite dramatically uh, to essentially stun the prey that they'll be holding in their jaws. Most things they're going to eat are going to be roughly the same size as their mouth. Um, but of course, you'll get you'll always get ambitious animals um, that will go slightly larger and you will find they'll thrash them around, stun them and they may then take limbs off. So with this particular um, spider I was looking at the other day, it was sort of about three times the size of the lizard's mouth. So after he'd stunned it, he just picked off the legs, started eating those and then worked onto the main body. But yeah, it's quite a quite a ferocious thing for a tiny animal that you can see doing. Almost if you think alligator like um, thrashing around in the water, they're doing that on land for you. So they'll chew that through and they'll swallow as much of it as they can whole. Um, it just tends to be they'll they'll tear off any any edge limbs um, if they're able to. So their prey, you tend to find them eating mainly the inverts here, um, that they'll be spotting anything that's small enough for them to be able to grab. Um, predators, much larger list, um, of course, many things will eat our common lizards. Um, the big one for the common lizard populations we have within London, and we do have quite a lot of them, do tend, does tend to be the cats. Um, we do expect many natural predators to have a go at our lizards. Um, cats tend not to necessarily eat them, um, but they will tend to bring them indoors. So they may have brought it in to show it off that they've found something or they've caught something. Um, they tend to put quite often the lizards then will die of shock um, because quite often it's being played with. So they may be punctured by the cat and they've probably already dropped its tail the minute the cat's grabbed them. Um, but they are they are a predator still in essence. Um, they may eat them, but more likely just to just to kill them for the, the thrill of the hunt. So that's one of the animals we do have a look for. Um, if you've got a common lizard population near a very urban area, it's a, a good thing to, to monitor if you've got cats about. So we'll just briefly dip into licensing. Um, just look into what legal protection um, there is. Just like in my amphibian talk, there is a variety of different sort of protections out there. Um, on our website, there's a, a full list of all of this. If you did want to really read about what annexes of each of these um, actually sort of affect our species. But the key thing to take away from this is that common lizards aren't a European protected species. They are on um, the UK sort of priority species list um, have and have been since 2010, um, but they don't have as much protection as some of our others like the sand lizard does. They don't require licensing for surveys, um, so unlike smooth snakes or sand lizards or when you move into the amphibians, things like the great crested newt that require a license for you to go near them and handle them and look for them. Uh, they aren't, aren't under that. Um, the key things that their kind of protection that covers them along with the slow worm is to be protected from anyone intentionally going out and killing them or injuring them. Um, also, you cannot take them from the wild um, and sell them. That also goes to the point of buying. So if you did ever find uh, online anywhere people trying to sell common lizards, um, do report it. You can report it to Nat um, Natural England and, and they will follow that up. It is an offence to do so. Um, but yeah, 
you can though go out and you can take as many photos of them as you like and have a look in their habitats and work with whoever your local landowner is to survey for them. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the surveying in a, in a few slides time. Um, so just looking at what habitats they like. Now, I think that first big line, which is found in a wide variety of habitats, is perfect for the common lizard. You saw on their sort of species distribution map that came from MBN Atlas earlier on. Um, it's very clear they're found pretty much everywhere in the UK. Um, they're quite happy everywhere. Um, so you'll find them in heathlands, you'll find them in grasslands, you find them quite often along rail embankments. So maybe another reason why um, little wormwood scrubs is a, is a good place for them as it's got that kind of area nearby. They're quite happy in brownfield sites, um, which is actually where most reports we get as a charity from common about common lizards in London are actually from areas that are quite urbanised. Um, so you will spot them out and about. They don't mind a bit of disturbance um, regarding the kind of habitat that's there. Yep, and you'll find them either all the way down towards the coastal grasslands. Um, I like the last two points are very contradictory in themselves that they're quite happy, not just everywhere, but they're quite happy in a very small population, but they're also pretty happy in very high density populations. Um, so this will, of course, to get those kind of numbers, you go and have to do a full survey to get an idea of not just the presence or absence of whether or not you have them on your site. If you really want to have a look at how many your sort of habitats or, or your site or your park or location um, can sustain, you want to get a good idea of how many how many are actually there. But to just have a little look at a few pictures of uh, nice places <laughs> you could find them. Um, bogs or areas like this around ponds, you'll find common lizards in these kind of areas. Um, at this time of year, you're less likely to find them, but in the middle of sort of summer, you would quite happily find them near this kind of area. Uh, the, boggier, the boggier area or sort of the damper the area tends to be where there's a higher density of invertebrates, so things they're going to be eating, they will spend time uh, around there. Um, going back to this sort of alligator or crocodile prophecy, uh, common lizards can swim. Um, they don't readily jump into the water and swim off, uh, kind of like grass snakes do. Grass snakes love the water, um, but you will find them swimming if need be. If, if there's a, a point in which they're startled or um, they need to be able to cross an area or they're sort of locked in by any form of sort of puddle or anything like that or a small pond, they will swim across it. Um, they swim just like sort of a, a bearded dragon or or a crocodile in the way that you'll find um, they'll completely loosen their back legs and it'll go sort of adjacent to their tail and they'll thrash the tail around to propel them across the water. Also another interesting thing you can go away on YouTube if you want to see one swim. Um, it's quite an interesting sight, it's not an animal we, we often think about in the water. Of course moorlands um, and heathlands and places like this, um, the big expanses, is where you're going to find them as well. It's sort of a more traditional habitat you'd expect them to be within. We're going again to this sort of a concept of whether it be brownfield sites or sort of urbanised sites or places where, where there's been a bit of human impact, shall we say. Um, so these kind of spaces are perfect for common lizards as well. Um, this photo here, although it may not look much in, you know, to us if, if we're trying to uh, look after a space and make it look um, aesthetically pleasing, we might not think this is great for wildlife or, or us as people, um, but this is actually absolutely perfect for, for a common lizard. It's got everything they would possibly need. Um, they can easily bask along this sort of the, the outer shell of the um, shed here. So they'll use these sort of wooden planks which will retain more heat. They'll happily bask along this kind of line. It's perfect. Not only is that going to have good sunlight hitting it, not only is it going to retain the heat, but if they do spot you coming close to take a photo, it's very easy for them to dart straight into this long grass here. Nine times out of ten, our sort of spottings or any form of sightings of common lizards will be found on sort of an edge habitat. They love mosaics of habitat. So if you've got a whole variety of different places and different sort of um, sort of topography or different heights of vegetation or things around, you'll find them in those sort of middle bits, in those lines um, where they've got the best of both worlds, essentially, um, which is also why when you go to places like um, I to think the Rain and Marshes, so the RSPB Reserve just further out than Barkin and Dagenham, so going towards Essex, or even the London Wetland Centre where they've got their boardwalks, you quite happily find common lizards basking along the edges of boardwalks. So quite often when you're walking along, whether it be on the handrail elements or right along um, the sides where there's sort of overgrown grass, they're quite happily basking in those kind of spaces. 
Um, you'll also find on sites like that, so reserves, you may sometimes walk through and you might think it's a bit strange if you're seeing there's a, a lovely boardwalk or a lovely uh, wooden panelled fence but there are little gaps or little slits that have been cut out quite often. They've been cut out for the common lizards um, so they can basically nip in to a little gap within the wall where they feel a bit more contained and safe, hidden away from predators. And that's where they'll choose to bask before they, they run away. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a, a great thing to be able to spot when you're when you're out and about. So we'll just talk a bit about the surveying behind them. Um, so if any of you are particularly like, yes, let's go out and have a look for these um, these species. Um, it's a great thing to do, particularly next summer if the weather's lovely and uh, sunny and, it, and, it's, and it's warm and what we're kind of looking for. Um, we'll talk through here what kind of conditions, what kind of places you want to be looking at. Um, and of course, for, for us, as a charity that, that specialise in our reptiles and amphibians, it's one of the greatest things you could possibly do um, for us, of course, is to go out locally to your areas and your parks and places and have a look for what's there and then report back what you do see because um, it adds to this sort of conservation effort of if we know how well our species are doing or vice versa if they're not doing very well and if we need to put more sort of time or energy into a specific species or a specific area um, to help them further. So the key reasons here before we do any form of surveying is why are you surveying? What is it you would like to find out? Um, so you need to be clear of this before you, you're going to just sort of turn up with your mats or anything like that of just to get an idea of what, what is it you want to achieve from this. So presence and abs absence surveys, um, great for, as I was mentioning there, conservation organisations or, or any um, local based conservation. Um, you won't be able to conserve something if you don't know it's there. Um, so of course the best thing that's possible is if you find out you've got common lizards on site, at that point is when you can start to take the steps towards helping them out. And that's even at the point on a really, really local scale of a garden. It's the exact same that if you've never noticed there are there and then one year you go out and you're doing a survey for this. So you're going out the perfect time of day, the perfect time of year to spot them and you start spotting them. You may then at that point decide, actually, I will cut, up, cut out little holes in my fence to allow them to bask in those places. I might leave more edges a bit more unkept just so that they've got areas um, to be able to hide. Um, of course, the second element of that is for the records of having them, so any planning consideration. Um, the best way for them to get any form of protection is, of course, if we know they're there. If we're unaware that the species are there, um, they're not going to be mitigated against. Um, so, of course, if you do ever spot them, it is the perfect thing to do is to report them, particularly this group of animals, um, report them to us or to your local biodiversity centre or particularly the actual landowner if um, you're doing it on behalf of someone else, um, just so that they're aware what they've got. You're going to move into a more detailed survey if you're going for that version. Um, so you wanted to get an idea of where, where are they on my site? You may have a small site, maybe a few hectares, but then you might have a massive site, a couple of hundred hectares. So you want to have an idea of what parts of the site are they using? What are they enjoying on the site? What areas should have them but don't have them? What should we be doing to encourage them into that area? You get an idea of abundance. So again, when we were talking about they're quite happy in small populations, but they also thrive in sort of a thousand or so um, individuals in a population. How many have you got? And then habitat preferences. Is there certain things on your site? Um, it's all great and good. As we always say uh, with everything in sort of nature and wildlife, the textbooks will tell you to do something specifically, but then you might find that your population of these actually really prefer something else you've put out. Um, a great example of this is we'll talk a bit about um, the sort of survey maps we put out and the preferences that certain populations seem to have. Some populations love metal, some populations prefer roofing felt. It is baffling, but get an idea essentially on a detailed survey of what is it that they do prefer in, in your population. And then, of course, monitoring. Um, this is a much longer term um, effort, of course, where you're going back year on year, multiple times through that season to get an idea of what's happening with your population. Um, this is incredibly important um, for particularly long term effects on a species. Um, so for us, one of our big sort of target species, is actually what our London project is based on, is actually the decline of the common toad. The reason that we know that is we've had 40 years of monitoring populations of toads around the UK and how they're doing. And it's only from that that we've been able to pull out the data that actually there's been a dramatic decline. So even on a site based but sort of basis, um, you can still figure out are they doing well or are they not doing well? And then if you have just discovered they're on your site, 
um, you're going to start to have a look at how you manage that area. So if one year you coppice a whole bunch of trees and you end up finding, oh, you know what, our common lizards did really well with less um, coverage, sort of canopy coverage, more sort of light hitting the ground. That's actually done quite a positive thing for them. It might then justify keeping sort of tree works in your line of work or potentially the other way around. Do, do more log piles need to occur? Have you removed things? Things like that. Talking a bit about conditions, again, I don't know if any of you are taking notes while listening to this. Uh, this is all available on the website, this whole surveying element. There's a whole guide you can download that is about reptile surveying, um, so I don't, you don't need to furiously take notes um, necessarily. But ideas about sort of the time of day that you're looking for. Um, it is going to depend on the weather. It always is. Um, day by day, of course, it's, it's very different. It can be anything from sweltering hot um, to just raining all day, but generally in spring, um, where it's not incredibly hot or we don't expect it to be incredibly hot, you can survey most of the day really. You're looking from about 11 o'clock when they start to get active because the day's got a little bit warmer, all the way through to about four, you'll spot them out and about. Whereas summer, uh, you're going to avoid basically the middle of the day. Um, the hottest time of the day is when you're less likely to find them when out and surveying. So because of course, uh, when you're surveying, you need to be able to spot them and it's not going to be basking, uh, common lizards aren't going to be basking in direct sunlight, um, if the heat's already there on the ground, they're going to have to be basking in the period of time where it's not incredibly hot. Um, they're going to be staying under things, essentially, if it is that warm, um, which is great for them. Uh, but for us, to make it a little bit tricky to survey for them if they're, if they're evading you in the shadows, which is not where we expect reptiles, reptiles to be. So going from not just on a day by day basis, what time of year? Um, so the best time of year, pretty much from when we were talking about when they emerge, so through March um, through to June is your best kind of time. It's when they're, they're out holding their territories, it's when they're all mating, it's when you'll find them out basking, particularly the females. When the females um, are gravid and they have all of their sort of eggs that they're incubating, you'll find them out and basking quite often um, through May and June, so it's something to be looking for. Now, this kind of time of year, so September, October, you will still start to spot them out, particularly the juveniles. Um, you'll find the juveniles just consuming lots and getting ready for their sort of first hibernation season. Um, but as of the last couple of months, we avoid July and August, although admittedly our August this year hasn't been the greatest weather wise. Uh, we tend to avoid um, July and August a bit just due to, again, the temperatures just being so much higher. If it's always that warm, you're just going to run into the same problem that they probably are being active, but they're not going to be active as consistently in certain time frames because it's going to be so warm, they're going to be hidden away more often than sitting on your lovely mats that you've put out or anything like that. So to get an idea about those weather conditions, Sorry, those. Um, what you're kind of looking for, it's quite a big range really, from about 8 to 18 degrees. That's kind of what you're looking for. When you start to go lower than that, you tend to find them. They won't be out and basking, so there's no real point. All the way up to above 18 degrees, um, again, it's going to be too warm for them to be out and basking where you're going to be doing your best sort of surveying. I should add that, of course, um, below 8 degrees, you may still find them out and around. I mentioned earlier about their range. Um, speaking about you'll find them all the way up into the Arctic Circle. Um, they can survive quite happily to about minus three degrees. Um, it's again something I'm going to employ you to go away and look up, but you can look at the way that they, they partially freeze um, their body essentially, um, their organs and the water within their body for that period of time to essentially uh, sort of semi semi frozen state, uh, shall we say, uh, for that period of time, but then they'll get reactive as it gets um, gets warmer. But your best kind of time really to be able to spot them and see them doing most is between 8 and 18 degrees. Sun, broken cloud, um, again, just when you're going to get most of the time, you're going to be getting sun hitting that floor. Um, little or no wind, again, just to dis just to stop the disturbance. Uh, you're more likely to have the lizards more spooked if it's very windy and all your vegetation is, is moving around and no rain. Uh, rain isn't greatest uh, for them to be out and basking. They're not going to want to be saturated um, whilst out there in the sun. But when that rain eases off, so sometimes if we've had, a, well, as we have had this year, uh, if we had August showers, for instance, um, followed by a nice sort of sunny patch where it's not too sunny and not too warm, um, it's quite easily find them out and basking at that period of time. Um, but 
as with everything, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago with nature, it is possible to see them in almost any weather. I never want to tell you that if you've if you started your day surveying, it started really promising at 11 o'clock. Um, if by one o'clock uh, the weather's got a bit sort of colder, so you're thinking actually maybe I'll continue or maybe I'll go home. Um, you never know. Uh, I still think persevere. And it's also part of the beauty of doing these surveys multiple times over a season. You may have a day where it's just not not a good day to spot them, but the next day um, the exact same, uh, maybe less than perfect conditions and you'll spot them all. Uh, it's just the way that it goes with that. So where should you be looking? So we've had an idea of why we're surveying, what time of year we're surveying, surveying and why we're doing it. Uh, where should we be looking? So you're going to be considering things like the vegetation structure. We spoke a bit about those mosaic habitats or those edges. So here's a good example. Um, so this is this sort of um, log pile or sort of coppiced wood in this area. Great place for it to be able to um, to bask because it's nice and open, easy, direct sunlight. But at the exact same time, if it noticed this person taking the photo, it's not much effort at all for it to disappear into the undergrowth here or go this way into this undergrowth and we've lost visuals of it. So essentially you want to think a bit like a predator when you're thinking about vegetation of where would you want to go where you've got the best of both essentially where if you was a predator and you're looking for them um, yeah what's going to be hardest for you to be out of spots so you want to look for your best place to eat them and then go slightly off to the edge to where the worst place is and that's where you'll find your common lizards in the middle. Um, the extent, of course, um, how big is this site um, <laughs> that you're looking for? So get an idea of where you will be going. Uh, so the aspect and topography. So you want things that are generally south facing for that sunlight. Um, how what is the site like? Of course, surveying in a in a sort of moorland is very different to surveying in the cliffs in Devon. Uh, get an idea about what and where you're going to be looking for. Connectivity. So we spoke a bit about railway lines. Um, is there any places you should be? pushing yourself to go near. Is it going to be beneficial for you to not only have a look on your site? Should you be looking a little bit onto that um, onto that railway line? Is there any other sites very nearby that that could have connected them to? Should you be looking there as well? Because you don't know. You may find that you might find one site um, is heavily um, surveyed, but then you go a road or two away and no one's had a look there. But you might also find a population or even the same population that's moving around. And of course, the history. Um, there's a lot to figure out on, on sites of, of records that have gone back many, many years uh, to get an idea of where have they been found previously, um, even if not sort of last year's sort of historical records, but you want to go much, much further um, to where were they traditionally found? If you haven't done it for a few years, where did we find them 10 years ago? And sort of start your start your journey and looking for them there. So we'll just go through two survey methods um, that are a good sort of place to start. Um, so the first of which, um, visual encounter, it's probably the easiest of all survey methods. Uh, pretty much you're going to be choosing a walk, uh, a route to walk. Um, so you can go down that, so it could be a path, it could be sort of the edge of your park um, that you're going to go around. It's a great thing to go on, it's very low effort. Um, it's essentially you're going to decide on the route you're going to use. You're going to walk that many times across the summer period um, and that's what you're going to do on and on and off. Um, you could have multiple different people walking those routes. If you've got a massive site, you could have people doing separate routes. It's a nice and easy thing to be able to do. No equipment is needed. Pretty much a, a sheet of paper or a, a clipboard with a pen or a pencil um, to record what you're spotting. Of course, um, if you want to go a step further, I always think it's a good idea to take a camera out with you um, just to be able to get a snap of anything. Particularly if you're finding they're quite skittish, uh, you might need to stand a bit further back to be able to get um, an idea of what you are spotting. So that's what I would advise. Um, and then it's quite good that you generally don't need any permission um, for this. So it's quite an easy thing to do. You're not putting anything down. So when we think about um, particularly amphibian surveying, um, you can't just set bottle traps up. You can't set pit, pitfall traps up um, wherever you like because you may harm certain species. But you certainly can go for a walk through a park and just have a look at where you think um, these animals could be. Of course, in the brackets there, uh, depending on whose land you're walking on to, uh, I'm not encouraging you just to go anywhere. I'm sure the, uh, the MOD wouldn't be particularly happy if you go, hey, that common looks fantastic for, for common lizards. I'm just going to pop on with my clipboard um, and write what I see. So just, just be mindful, of course, where you're going, <laughs> if it is owned by someone else, uh, just to let them know why you're there, get permission for it. Um, yeah. 
as well. I always think I should I should mention that because even the best intentions don't want anyone getting into trouble looking for lizards. Obviously, the negatives of doing a visual encounter is for some species, it's not going to be great for you. Uh, so the slow worm is a great example for that. Um, slow worms, they'll tend to bask under things, so you're not going to immediately spot them. Um, so you may find if they're sort of tires or logs, you're more likely to find them in the sort of the shallow areas of that. Also, being a, a species of reptile that's semi fossil um, a lot of the time, if they get any form of disturbance, unlike the lizard, which will just run off, um, the slow worm will dig down, go straight down a hole in the ground, and yeah, that's gone for you to be a spot. Um, it's not the greatest way to determine absence, um, just because if there's been a lot of disturbance, even if not you, if there's, let's say, been people out and about also walking around the site, or if it's consistently walked on, or all the areas that are best to look at are next to a path or something like that. Um, you can't really tell even if they're absent because it just might be the conditions aren't right for you to be able to spot them when people are generally allowed in those kind of spaces. Also, the last point there um, is that it's not compar comparable between surveyors. This is why I do think it's a good idea um, to, to take, camera, take camera with you. If you are in the lucky situation that you're on a site where there could be many different types of lizard, um, Again, just to make sure that what you are submitting as your data um, is the same as what other people would be would be submitting. So the second method uh, that we tend to do is looking at artificial refugia. Um, so this is any form of cover objects that will provide sort of a, a slightly better um, area or a slightly more lucrative area for, for the reptiles to bask. Um, so this is great. Uh, it works for all of our native British species. Actually, it works even for the non-natives. Essentially, you're just going to put something down that is absolutely perfect for them to bask on. Um, the only problems of this is there's quite a lot of uh, effort at the beginning of it to get an idea of where are those best places to put these mats out. Um, and then making sure you've got sort of an idea of how big your site is, where you're going to be putting them. Uh, that links in very quickly with cost. Um, it's not too expensive to get one or two mats, but if you're doing a full survey across an entire site where you're you've maybe buying 50 or 60 mats, uh, it can add up um, over a period of time. Again, with this one, um, you need to get landowner permission for this, um, primarily because if you're going around leaving corrugated iron sheets all across somewhere like Holland Park, um, I'm sure the parks officers would walk around and firstly think you're just littering if they don't know what's happening there that you're going to want uh, explicit permission uh, for doing anything like that and also for the public um, quite often we find any mats or anything we put down we tend to write sort of um, uh, sort of surveying or anything like that written on it something sort of maybe it's being used for scientific methods just to stop people from moving them it does happen uh, I know a few years back um, we did common lizard surveys in a place called East Wickham open space in the borough of Bexley um, although very well intentioned, we found that the local kids also using the site had uh, when we turned up with our GPS with all of our mats um, to find where they all were and check what was under them. We'd found all of them um, in, a, in a sort of shrubby area that had been quite nicely uh, fashioned into a little den for these kids to sit in. Uh, but of course, completely blew the survey out uh, because they'd been moved. So just do be mindful um, where you're putting mats out. Um, what kind of area and what kind of people are around. Um, yeah, they, they might not be exactly exactly where they are. Um, I will also add for that that if you are putting lots of mats out, make sure whoever's in charge of it knows the exact amount of mats you put down first. So don't put out 50 mats and then at the end you go, I don't know how many, did I leave out 40 or 50? Because you've got no idea if you're leaving any out for the rest of the season. <laughs> um, the best thing to do is just to use both in combination with each other. So lots of visual walks, um, having a look, at the searches and also doing a um, refugia like these. So these are three main uh, three main refugia that we tend to use. So we've got the metal at the top, uh, we've got bitumen in the middle and we've got roofing felt at the bottom. Um, there's a variety of different things you can use for this. Um, I said earlier on about species being sort of, um, there could be an ideal for one population, but it's not ideal for another. Um, there is no right or wrong when it comes to the refugia that you use. Um, if you can get hold of a whole bunch of roofing felt for far cheaper um, than corrugated metal, then by all means do that. Um, that's what we that's what we would advise. As long as you've got as many examples as you can on your site when you're surveying, the better. 
sizing um when we think about sort of 0.5 meters squared definite minimum there um i would probably err i think in general frog life would say really uh, you're going to look at one meter square if you can go bigger than that even better um because when it becomes so small you're just reducing reducing the opportunity for any of those reptiles to bask on it. Um, it's less likely for them to be able to see it in lucrative. It's less safe. If you think about you're a tiny animal and you want to hide either on top of or you want to hide around the edge of something or underneath something, um, you're going to want it to be as large as possible. Um, density, I just touched upon that. The more of them you've got down, the better. Um, you can put it down in all the best places that you think on site and keep it very, very small. Um, so you might only put 10 out thinking there's 10 great areas, but you might get none. But then if you also included the areas that are not quite great, um, you might then find that is actually where all your common lizards are. So it's a good thing to be able to, to look out for. Um, just as a caveat at the bottom, carpet tiles um, have also worked quite well for slowworms just because they hold that heat for a longer period of time um, and don't become too warm. Um, they will actually warm a little bit of the soil below. Um, I should add, if you do these um, and you ever get a very large ant's nest, uh, appear because you will get non <laughs> non target species use these mats of course they don't no one can read a sign that says common lizards only um if you find a large ant's nest underneath the best thing to do is actually move the mat so just move the mat maybe a meter or so away um you tend not to find them if there's huge ant colonies uh, just as just as a tip um a few other tips here is just the way you survey so you want to walk slowly you want to generally look a meter or two ahead of you when you're walking so don't look exactly where you're standing you want to walk ahead of you want to look ahead of where you've disturbed you want to walk as as lightly as possible you want to keep those sort of vibrations in the ground um, as minimal as possible avoid casting shadows um this kind of depends really um so this is for sure if you're walking a route uh, try your best not to cast shadows when you're looking at species because of course if you're in full sunlight it's the same as you're more likely to notice if someone turned the light off in the room you're sitting in than if someone didn't turn the light off and they're there taking a photo of you or something like that um, so if you can avoid casting any shadows or changing any light conditions for them that's perfect actually works the reverse for if you're looking under a map so if you're looking under a map where it's very dark, the best thing you can do is have your back square on to where the sunlight's coming from so that you create a shadow. So that as you lift that mat up, anything underneath isn't going to get as dramatic a light change. Um, it's the best way of sort of going about doing it. You want to listen for movement. Uh, you will hear them, hear them scurrying around. You'll hear little sort of rustles around. Of course, it could be other things. It could be it could be field mice or wood mice or something like that that are in the area. Um, but it's just as likely it could be a common lizard that you spotted, uh, particularly if you've seen one or two already and you hear a bit of movement later on. Uh, do do hold out um, and keep your ear to the ground, as they would say. Patience. Um, I think any people I always find uh, good reptile surveyors generally started in the bird world uh, where they're very good at sitting in hides for many hours. If you can stay pretty much stationary and keep an eye on one area for a long period of time, if you've got the right area, you're very likely to be able to spot them. Have a look for any dumped stuff around the site. So this here is a good example. This is a tire that was just dumped on the floor. Of course, that kind of um, material there, uh, it's going to hold that warmth very nicely. It's amongst that higher vegetation. So absolutely perfect. Everything that lizard was looking for, um, but straight here, right in front of them. Um, and then just again, mentioning this sort of mosaic basking. Again, keeping to those edges, you may sometimes find, I suppose, more true to the word mosaic is you might actually find you're only seeing part of the common lizard or part of any reptile really you may only see the head sticking out and then the tail and stuff could still be underneath the vegetation uh, just keep an eye out you may not see you may not luck out essentially in seeing an entire common lizard at once like this um you might just see part of them sneaking out from the edge so we're just going on to the the final part um of sort of the the talk which is capture and handling I think I've done, I've done a talk a bit quicker than, than normal. I'm 10 minutes ahead of my normal schedule. Um, it's capture and handling. This is probably the number one thing I'd like you to take away with you. Um, if, if you go on and you decide you want to go out and start surveying for these animals, um, please take a note of a few of the things here. Of the first question you should always ask is, do you need to handle uh, that lizard? Um, it is stressful, of course, anything that's that small in comparison to you, you will always look like a predator um, to an animal that's that tiny, that is 
quite often prey to most things. Um, so do be mindful of that. Um, that actual stress can also affect the males. Um, so if you're putting the males under a lot of stress, if that male loses his tail, um, particularly during his breeding season, it tends to be they're not as successful. Um, the success rate drops by about 80 percent if he's not got his tail when he's trying to attract females. Um, I'd like to think it's not that the females are so shallow that they need a nice long tail if they're going to choose them, but um, it just tends not to be. They're not doing as well if they don't have that tail there. So if you can avoid letting them drop their tails, that is the best. Um, it can cause problems for the gravid females. Again, that stress can affect sort of essentially the, the incubation, let alone if you handle them wrong. Um, again, such a sort of small animal. So you remember we're thinking their actual body area where all their organs is, it's quite small. So again, we're just only thinking that sort of six, seven centimetres, it's quite easy for us to apply too much pressure and damage anything within within her. So you want to keep an idea there of if it's going to be a successful pregnancy, if you're going to pick her up and bother her. They can lose a meal um, from regurgitating any prey items. If they've just consumed something and you've picked them up, quite often the first thing they'll do, well, second thing they'll do after dropping a tail is they'll regurgitate anything they're currently trying to eat to be able to get away as quickly as possible. Um, I mentioned that sort of survival and breeding, so the survival I mentioned earlier on, the if around this time of year or nearing sort of autumn winter time, um, if they're dropping that tail, that is where their fat and energy stores are. Um, so, yeah, it's best off they keep that to use it for the winter period of time. And then likewise as well, they're not going to behave naturally. I always think the nicest way to report or record anything that's actually happening with your with your common lizard population or, or any population of lizards, um, it's better if you're seeing them in their normal habitat. Uh, they're not going to be doing what they're supposed to be doing when they're sitting in your hand. Um, it's not going to be the behaviours they'd, they'd expect, for sure. However, there is of course always a however. Um, for education and scientific study, of course, there can always be justification for if you're bothering, I don't know, a few, a few common lizards, over a season from maybe if you're doing a full inter sort of detailed study and you're also checking out the sex of every individual so you you're going to be looking not only for those head shapes if you're not seeing those stripes you want to get an idea of how many individuals maybe you're taking photos of sort of belly patterns to see if it's different individuals you're spotting maybe you want to have an idea of when we were talking about that cyclical event of the the sort of mating strategies maybe you want to be having a look at the males you're finding what type of male are they? Are they yellow bellied males? Are they white bellied males? One of the things you might be looking for there. So of course, in that kind of scenario, by all means, the same with education. If if the easiest way for you to engage when out on a site, um, if you have a common lizard that's there, very sort of very placid, maybe they're basking quite happily, you can get really, really close. Um, maybe you're just going to put it into, into a tray just to have a look at, and that inspires another generation or another group of people to look after them, then by all means, uh, but as long as that's just not a consistent, every lizard you find will be picked up and bothered. And that pretty much stands for most things when it comes to wildlife. Um, we always think about that when we say pond dipping. If you bother one newt by pond dipping um, to have a look at, but if that inspires um, whoever's having a look at that to look after them in the future because they now feel more connected to nature, then by all means, uh, that one newt has done its service. Um, but yeah, not consistently. The second point here, the stress and effects um, can be greatly minimised if done correctly. Um, so this is very true for people that go out and survey all the time, um, have a very, very low sort of um, sort of tail shedding um, sort of rate, essentially. So some people will do this so many times for a season and have done it for so many years, they'll know the perfect technique to approach and to lift up um, a lizard without them feeling so stressed that they need to do any unnatural behaviours in the sense of dropping tails, regurgitating any foods. Um, and with that kind of thing, that's going to be a case of if you've got a local amphibian or reptile group uh, near where you are that's very active and they're doing lots of surveying themselves, by all means, ask to go along, uh, work in conjunction with someone. If there's one person in your group that's done this for years, by all means, let them be the person to lift it up and then you can get up close and you can get your snaps. Uh, this is even true even at Frog Life. Um, there's colleagues of mine that spend way more time um, working with, with the reptiles. I would uh, I would certainly, if I was out on a, on a walk with them and we came across anything and we were doing any form of study on them, by all means, I would leave it to someone who's even better practiced 
at lifting any lizards up than me um just because it's not it's not worth the the, the extra stress on the animal if someone knows how to do it perfectly but don't let that discourage you in the way of going out and having a look for them. Um, I certainly think there's a lot of value to certainly recording these populations. So this leads me just to, to the end really in saying any questions. Um, and the other sort of thing from me ahead of, ahead of the question is just saying thank you um, to Trevor and the team and the Friends of group at Holland Park for, for inviting me to do another talk about the lizards and um, yeah. Hopefully I've inspired. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. As always, it's really entertaining and um, good knowledge. So thank you. Um, yeah, um, we've got time for a few questions. Um, anonymous. Um, what do common lizards like to eat? I think you covered that. But are there any favourite foods they like to eat? Uh, quite often the young ones you'll find eating spiders quite often. Um, so if you find them in gardens or around garden sheds, the most common prey, prey animal in that scenario tends to be um, the spiders. It tends to be the much larger, so the adult, um, so the, the slightly, yeah, the older um, common lizards, you will be the ones that you'll spot trying to eat earthworms or, or any larger kind of worms in that kind of sense. But um, yeah, most things they can fit in their mouth, they'll, they'll have a stab at, um, <laughs> for sure. Cool, and I think this question relates to um, the lack of um many animals in the UK. Um, why are there so few lizards or reptiles native to the United Kingdom? Is that due to the fact they live on an island? Yeah, so that's, that's actually a great question. Um, that is very much it, that we just don't have as much expanse of, um, of habitat for one, and that's particularly why we had many more species a long, long time ago because we had more untouched land, but also the fact that we are an island. Uh, there's less movement of animals across sort of boundary or, or border lines. Particularly if you move into mainland Europe, you'll see if you look at sort of a, a European guide of species, there's a vast number. And then you go to a smaller island like Ireland. Um, sorry, I, I realise sometimes my, my accent goes a bit off with that. But you look at Ireland and they barely have any um, herptofauna. So, <laughs> yeah. Very well, much. That, that was due to St. Patrick, though, wasn't it, Emily? Not, not anything biological. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, um, <laughs> The next question is um, asking, is there a good time to sort of um, cut back um, shrubs and shrubbery to protect lizards from, you know, being hurt, I presume, in the operations? Yep. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yep. Yeah, so it's a tough one, this. But again, that mosaic they do like. Um, we very much would stick with that policy of no mo may um, because that's when they're straight out and beginning their sort of periods of time of when they're looking to mate and they're holding those kind of territories. If you can either go quite early, so if your grass or your vegetation is quite high pre sort of March, you can start to go at that kind of time of year. But just to be mindful, there might be other species that are reliant on that. But ideally, I would say the best time of year for this, you're looking at autumn onwards. Um, as with many other animals, if you start cutting back, let's say late October, November time, maybe you're starting to build high vernacular or, or lizard basking banks or anything like that. If you come across them in their sort of areas that they're hibernating, potentially then just leave that area and, and work on another area. But yeah, autumn, winter time is your best kind of batch, but just keep an eye out for if there's any, yeah, where you're digging. Oh, so similar to advice with birds and nesting, isn't it, yeah. as well? Um, someone's asking a question, um, just things we can do to help and encourage lizards in their local area. Yep. Um, that's Maria. Yep, so, uh, yeah, there's quite a few good op opportunities or good ways to do that. Um, the big one there, it goes back to, again, a mosaic of habitat. So give them a nice range of things. Think about if you were a lizard, essentially, what would you want? Um, so you're going to want as much sort of sunlight hitting. So south facing banks, you want nice exposed areas that get lots of sun through most of the day. Uh, you want to encourage areas that have high density of invertebrates. So going back to that sort of pond prophecy that ponds are great, not just for the amphibians, every everyone needs them. Um, so by having boggy areas, you end up getting more sort of smaller flies, you'll get tiny invertebrates about, you'll get things like snails even. Um, and that's exactly what they'll be looking to eat. Um, 
And of course, you can go a step further, but if they're in your area and maybe maybe you've noticed they're there the season that you're looking, but you haven't yet got everything habitat wise there and ready to go, you can use surveying mats as a good sort of a cheat code, essentially, for if your habitat's not quite there yet, but you know the, uh, the reptiles are there, by all means, put mats out um, for them to use for this period of time. And then next year you can work on improving further. Um, there's more guidance, again, I should, I should mention, there's even more guidance on the website. We've got advice notes um, regarding each species that you can download to have a look at what, what you can add feature-wise. Cool, and um, a question, um, are they crepuscular or diurnal? I presume they're diurnal with their sort of, you know, their, um, their body heat. Yep, yep, they're diurnal. Um, so you tend to see them most active from about 11 o'clock. They're a bit of a lazy starter when it comes to the days um, and you'll get them sort of active through to roughly about five o'clock um, and then they're, they're back off again. Cool. And do they have any sort of social hierarchy um, or are they lone living species? Uh, tend to be quite solitary um, in their sort of approach. The only time you start to see any form of dominance or hierarchy is with the males and when they start mating. So essentially that is that kind of that, that sizing up um, regarding the larger males will tend to have the best areas. So a hierarchy in that sense for sure. Um, and the patterning belly wise um, is the only other way there's there's any separation between them. Um, but otherwise no, no distinct social based uh, hierarchy. But just if you're bigger, uh, particularly in, in the males, if you're bigger and stronger, you're more likely to have the best the best access to females and, and habitat. Cool. And then um, we kind of broadened the questions out to some people asking about reptiles. Is that okay? I'll just do two yeah. questions on reptiles. Um, a question, well, I used to um, work in um, Epping Forest, so I know there's adders there. Um, are there any, many sites in London with adders? Someone's asking. Yeah, there are sites. Um, there are sites all across most of the Greater London boroughs. Um, so all through West London, North London, um, areas of South London, um, you, there are adder sites. Um, the the only thing with adder sites it tends to be, and this is sort of I suppose the real sad thing when it comes to reptiles, is it's one of the few species that often don't get raved about um, by councils just because people will go out to persecute them. It's, it's really unfortunate that we're still in a a mindset that snakes are somewhat dangerous. Um, even the adder. I mean the. The other we have in the UK certainly isn't puff adder kind of status um, of danger, but um, yeah, they tend not to be as widely publicised. But there is quite a few populations about. Um, tend to be very small though, so even though the sites are there, it's very rare in the UK. You go to any site that has adders if they have more than about 20, 25 individual adders on that site. Uh, they're very yeah, small. I think there's something about social um, um, population fragmentation, isn't there, with adders that, that yep. people are worried about. Sorry, Emily, to cut in. Um, and the very, very last question. Um, it's not about snake. It goes back to lizards, but this time slow worms. Um, a, um, someone's asking, do they have unique markings on the underside of their head? And can you sort of use that as a distinguish between individuals? Uh, with slow worms? Yeah, with slow um, worms. So, yeah, I suppose you could use scales. Um, I'm just trying to think about slow worms from the underside. Um, you could you could use that. There will be different patterning slightly underneath them. Um, yes, I suppose if you if you got up, up close enough, uh, you definitely could. If you took them and took photos of them, you will oh, uh, you will find patterns um, underneath their throats. Generally, um, you tend to be able to sort of tell the individuals from the kind of area that they're within. The slow worms aren't as far sort of traveling. So if you kind of locked in your population, it's likely you're going to be seeing the same individuals year on year. Um, they're quite loyal um, to sites that they're they're at. Um, they're actually a really interesting interesting species that um, yeah they're extremely I think long lived, aren't they? As well, slow worms. Yes. Yeah. yeah, slow worms uh, can quite happily live up to about sixty years old. Um, in the wild, you tend to they quite happily get twenty to thirty years. Um, but yeah, they they're they're fascinating for when you think about them, particularly in cities um, on allotment plots where we come across them quite often how long they, they potentially have been on that site and what's changed around them is, uh, is fascinating. Um, cool, I think we'll we're, we're end it on that question. So that's great. So thanks again, Emily, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. Like I said, this is the last of our talks in our short series celebrating biodiversity in, in the Royal Borough, but we hope to be back in kind of autumn term 
with some talks on foxes and maybe parakeets and hopefully in person our annual fungi foray. So if you need any information about that, please get in contact and by the ecology inbox and any questions on amphibians and reptiles, um, I can direct them to Emily or you can um, um, check out Emily's website at foglife.com. Well, that may not be right. Yeah, I just made that up. <laughs> Uh, dot all, but yeah. Dot all, sorry. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> right, thank you everyone um, for attending and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye bye.